Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, we're going to get started, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim Wardell with Microsoft Government Affairs and the Microsoft PAC. We want to thank you all for coming today. I know almost all of you are PAC members, but if for some reason you are a guest or just a drop-in, please consider joining the Microsoft PAC or internal. I just type in MS PAC. Find a little bit more about the government affairs activity we do, a little bit more about our policy priorities, and um, consider joining with a contribution. Uh, two other quick housekeeping notes uh, before we introduce our uh, honored guest today, uh, Commerce Secretary uh, Carlos Gutierrez just confirmed yesterday that he will be coming out on February 16th. So that will be another event you'll be getting notice of probably in the next day or so. Um, and uh, probably will also be a lunch, but we will um, get that information out to current PAC members. And then the following week on February 21st, uh, we have Howard Dean will be coming out. So you get a chance, as uh, Mike Egan, my colleague, says, you get a chance to scream with Howard Dean on the 21st. and. Uh, should be a lively event. So um, now we get to our main event. We are honored to have uh, Paul Bremer here today. As many of you know, he is doing a uh, book tour through the Northwest for his recent book, My Year in Iraq. Um, he had the distinguished uh, position to be the only senior insider uh, working with the uh, uh, Saddam, the uh, following the, the collapse of Saddam Hussein's regime, and then he's able to kind of give us a whole account of um, from the holy city of Najaf to the White House Situation Room to the Pentagon E-Ring, revealing the hidden struggles among Iraq's politicians and America's leaders and confronting for the first time the reality of occupying a large Muslim nation in the heart of the volatile Middle East. And two other biographical notes to mention, he was appointed uh, ambassador to the Netherlands and served in that role from 83 to 86. And then President Reagan appointed him ambassador at large for counterterrorism from 86 to 89. He also served in the private sector as a managing director of Kissinger and Associates, uh, headed by former Secretary of State uh, Henry Kissinger. So I hope you all will please uh, help me welcome Paul Bremer. Let me mention really quickly, too, that there will be time for Q&A after, and um, he will also do some book signings. So please think about buying a book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, and uh, glad to see you all feeding yourselves well out there. Uh, I uh, thought what I would do is give you a brief overview on the situation we faced uh, in Iraq when I arrived there in May of 2003, give you a sense of some of the challenges we faced, and then leave uh, time for questions, because I'm sure there will be questions on your mind, and I'd be happy to answer those. Uh, let me start by saying that you probably have read that we worked in one of Saddam's palaces, one of these places he built with the money that was taken from the oil for food program. But it was certainly not palatial living when we got there. We had no electricity, no running water, no telephones. And I always remind people that the fact that we had no electricity had a good news, bad news side to it. The good news was it meant we had no communications with Washington. Um, <laughs> until he figured out how to find us. Bad news was it meant we had no air conditioning. And the temperatures by early May were already running between 115 and 120 in the day, cooling off, if you can call it that, to about 100 at night. And uh, about a week after we got there, the temperature went to 138. And I, I happened to be a Connecticut Yankee. So I, this felt pretty warm to me, and I was complaining to an Iraqi friend about it when he said, well, wait till summer comes, then you'll see. <laughs> now, I had working for me uh, about 3,000 civilians who were from 25 different countries. Every one of them, men and women, were volunteers who came to Iraq working 18 to 20 hours a day, seven days a week, just to help the Iraqis recover their country. It was dangerous work. We were subjected to regular attacks by mortars and rockets uh, in the green zone and I escaped a number of assassination attempts, the most dramatic of which I describe in chapter 9 of the book. We found a staggering range of challenges and needed action in three areas. We needed to get the Iraqis 
on a path to a democratic political system. Secondly, we needed to get the economy going. And third, we obviously needed to do something about security and stability. So we laid in place plans to deal with all three of these uh, areas. And what I want to do uh, this morning is just give you a sense of what our problems were in each of these areas, what our strategies were, and how I think we're doing. On the political front, I would call it political psychological front, it's very hard, I think, for any of us, even after my spending 14 months there, it's, even, it's very hard for us to understand how deeply traumatized Iraqi society had been by Saddam's dictatorship. He modeled his political system and his security forces openly, publicly, on Adolf Hitler's because he admired the way Hitler had been able to use his security services and his Nazi party to control the German people. So evidence of Saddam's brutality was pretty much everywhere around. For example, I done this question about Hitler. About a week after I got there, the acting foreign minister asked me to come visit the foreign ministry, which I did, and he showed me in the library where they had found several hundred copies of Mein Kampf in Arabic and in English because it was required reading uh, for his diplomats and members of his Mukhabarat, the intelligence services. I also early on visited the first of the major killing fields that we found, mass graves. Uh, you may remember that after the first Gulf War in 1991, the Shia, who had long been repressed by Saddam and his Sunni cronies, rose up against Saddam, and Saddam used his army to crush this rebellion br brutally and mercilessly. They basically sent the army with flatbed trucks into the towns and villages in the south of Iraq, sweeping up men, women, and children indiscriminately, and driving them into fields where they were machine gunned and thrown into common graves. The first of these mass graves I visited is in a town called Hilla, about 50 miles south of Baghdad. And when I got there, I saw a, f a field that was a grave site that was probably three times the size of an American football field with bags of bones uh, in it with people looking into these bones to try to find some uh, piece of jewelry, a piece of clothing, something that would identify the bones as being their daughter or their son or their aunt or their father. We estimated that in that mass grave alone, there were between 20 and 30,000 bodies. And during the time we were there, we found another 300 of these mass graves uh, around Iraq. The police stations under Saddam all had torture chambers, every single one of them. Torture was legal under Saddam Hussein. Uh, they also, most of them had rape rooms, including the Central Police Academy in Baghdad. I visited one day the Kurdish town of Halabja, which is up on the Iranian border in the northeast of the country. During the 1980s, Saddam's army conducted a program of genocide against the Kurds. The Kurds live in the north, as you probably know. Uh, and culminating that attack, that act of genocide, he used chemical weapons. The army used chemical weapons against his own citizens in 1988 and killed 5,000 uh, Kurds. You can see the tombstones laid up against the mountains there. The most conservative estimate holds that Saddam killed at least 300,000 of his own citizens. Uh, but since there are a million and a half Iraqis known to be missing, the number of Iraqis killed is no doubt much higher than 300,000. This, this tyranny of Saddam's lasted three times as long as Adolf Hitler was in power in Germany. So you can imagine the degree to which the psychological, you can imagine the degree of psychological pressure that had been put on the Iraqi people from this uh, terrible tyranny. Now we also had to deal with the economy. And the economy was a wreck because Saddam had basically misappropriated, misallocated capital for a period of almost 40 years and in effect also stolen lots of it as we saw in the oil for food uh, scandal. As a result, Iraq's per capita GDP decreased more than any country in the world between 1979 and 2002. And Iraq, which had been the leading country in the region, had its economy completely holed out from inside. 
in the 1990s when Saddam complained about the imposition of sanctions and how they were hurting the Iraqi people. In that same decade, Saddam himself cut health care spending by, by 90 percent, 90 percent. And at the end of 2002, according to the World Bank, Iraq then had the lowest life expectancy in the region and the highest infant mortality in the region. And this from a country that was very rich. Other essential services were no better. The schools, according to a UN study, at least half of the schools were so decrepit that they needed to be torn down and rebuilt. It was usual to have 180 students in a class, and they usually had about a, about a tenth of the books they needed. Before the war, unemployment was already running at 50 percent, according to Saddam's own Ministry of Planning. And as we started to get our arms around these problems, we found that we were facing a budget crisis. My advisors said, we are going to go broke as a country in the fourth quarter of 2003 or the first quarter of 2004. We couldn't really get good information about the budget because the budget had been a state secret under Saddam Hussein. What we did find was that only 8% of the budget was actually passed through the normal ministries. 92% of the budget was spent directly out of the presidential palace and not through the ministries, which, by the way, had, gave us real problems of capacity in those ministries when the time came to try to push the budget through the ministries rather than out through the presidential palace. We also faced the consequences of Saddam's chronic budget deficits. He simply ran the printing presses to cover the deficits, and the Ministry of Planning informed me when I arrived that at the end of 2002, the inflation rate in Iraq was 115,000 percent. Well, I, I could go on and give you a lot more data, but the, the point is we faced an economic crisis that was as deep as the Great Depression in the United States, combined with this terrible political and psychological trauma that people had been through. And we therefore needed to get action in both of these areas. So in the political side, the most important early steps were to cleanse the system of the old by focusing in particular on the senior ranks of the hated security forces and the criminal leaders of the Ba'ath Party. There's been a lot of misreporting about both of these decisions, so I'm going to take a minute to explain them. People have said that we made a mistake in disbanding Saddam's army. Actually, we made a mistake in choosing the word disbanding because there was no army to disband. When the army saw which way the war was going, particularly the Shia conscripts, Shia draftees, there were 315,000 of them, they simply went home. They went back to their farms. They went back to their families. They hated being in the army. They were brutalized by their, by their officers, and they just went home. So there was not a single unit of the army of Iraq standing anywhere in the country at liberation. There was no army. So the question we faced, in fact, wasn't whether to disband. It was whether to recall the old army. But recalling the old army would have had catastrophic political consequences because it was the army that had used those chemical weapons, had fought a genocidal war against the Kurds for a decade. And the Kurdish leaders were very clear to me that if we had tried to recall the army, they would have seceded from Iraq. Moreover, it was the army that had created those killing fields and mass graves among the Shia, who are 60 percent of the population. Same consequences would have followed if we had tried to force the Shia conscripts back into an army that they hated. So instead, we said we're going to create a new army, but we made a number of very important points. We said that anybody from the old army who wants to join the new army as a volunteer, if not a conscript army, is welcome to apply. And officers from the old army also can apply. And actually, by the time we left uh, a year later, as it happened, 80 percent of the enlisted men were from the old army, and all of the officers and NCOs were from the old army. Since I've left, the training has changed, and we've got more uh, new officers in there now. The same criticism has been made of the idea that when we de when we of our policy of debathification. Basically, this was a, a hated party, but we knew that many many people joined the party simply because they had to. It was the only way, for example, to get a job as a teacher. You had to join the party. Our quarrel wasn't with those people. The debathification decree was very narrowly focused and said simply that the top 
of the party could no longer be on the public payroll. They could go out and set up a business if they wanted to, be farmers. If they weren't criminals, they could leave the country. But that top 1% could no longer be in public service. Now, we needed to complement these backward-looking uh, measures with a forward-looking path to get Iraqis quickly before their own people as representatives of the Iraqi government. And working with my many, many colleagues, British, Australian, Polish, Romanian, we went out, fanned out across the country to find tribesmen, men and women, lawyers, uh, any kind of people who could help represent the government and put together a governing council of 25 Iraqis. This was done within two months of arrival. That governing council, in turn, appointed ministers that ran the government. We, we were also often, it's often been said that we were running the government. Actually, we weren't running it. We were ultimately responsible for it, but the ministers were in charge of policy personnel and budgets in their ministries, and there were 25 of them. In the fall of 2003, pressures built inside the U.S. government and in some other foreign governments for us to simply leave, turn over the uh, sovereignty to the uh, to this governing council that we had set up and get out. I resisted this and I describe in the book why I resisted it and the reason is I felt that given Iraq's political background they really needed some kind of a constitution that could define how the government would be structured. Was it going to be a parliamentary, a presidential system, or going to be one chamber or two chambers in parliament that established basic human rights and the protections of human and individual rights and a constitution which reasserted the rule of law in Iraq. After a lot of discussions, the president agreed with me that we should not leave until we had got at least an interim constitution in place, which we did March 1, 2004. And it's a remarkable document. Most of what we wrote with the Iraqis then was carried into the constitution that was just approved uh, in October. Moreover, we laid out at that time the path to democratic elections. And despite the predictions of the armchair experts back here, every single one of the steps in that path has been followed by the Iraqi people against the dire warnings of the terrorists. Remember, they had three different elections last year. And the terrorists' guidance was, if you vote, you die. They basically said to every Iraqi, you better not go vote in those elections. So every single Iraqi man or woman who went and voted in those elections was taking his or her life in their own hands. They were risking their life to vote. The turnout at the election on December 15th that we just saw was higher than the turnout in any American presidential election in 125 years. The last time we turned out at that rate was when Rutherford Hayes beat Samuel Tilden in 1876. Now the Iraqis really want to run their country. They risked their lives and they turned out in enormous numbers. Now, this didn't just happen. This happened because we set, I set aside $760 million to help build civic society, which is a necessary underpinning. Democracy is not just elections. There's a lot of other things that have to happen. And I set aside $760 million to, for example, establish women's centers in all 18 provinces democracy centers, NGOs to teach about human rights, professional associations for lawyers, doctors, dentists. We even held uh, 500 elections all around the country, right at the village level, if, for sports foundations and sports federations so that Iraq, Iraq could be accepted back into the International Olympic uh, movement from which it had been expelled. And I watched with great joy when the Iraqi flag was brought into the stadium in Athens uh, the following year after they had been accepted back into the uh, movement. Now, uh, I'm not naive about the political situation. It's certainly that, that there will be bumps in the road uh, as they move ahead, but the process is started and the direction is good. So that was our political plan. Let me take a moment and talk about our economic plan. The first problem we had was unemployment. Unemployment, as I mentioned before the war, had been 50%. We didn't know what it was after the war, but it was presumably higher. 
And we were the largest employer because we were the government. Millions of Iraqi families depended on a salary from us and hadn't been paid for two months. Millions more were pensioners, government pensioners, and they hadn't been paid for two months either. Because the payroll system was obscure and confusing, I mandated a very simple four-grade payroll system the week after I got there so that we could start paying out these back salaries, and we did that within a week. I also allocated several hundred million dollars for public works programs to create hundreds of thousands of jobs in the summer of 2003. None of this was easy because the banking system was closed down, and so we, and, and we had a shortage of Iraqi currency. A lot of the currency had been destroyed in flooding in the central bank vaults. So we were paying about $200 million a month in salary, but it had to be paid in cash and it was paid in dollars all over the country. A, a massive undertaking considering that there were no banks and there was a war going on. Moreover, as we, as we continued this, by the end of, end of June, it was clear that there was a real risk that if we continued to pay all of these expenses in dollars, we were going to dollarize the Iraqi economy which, as I told my colleagues, would have been a catastrophe because it would have suggested to the Iraqis and to everybody else that we were simply going to annex Iraq. They were going to make them part of the dollar zone. So after a lot of debate with my colleagues, I decided we would replace the entire Iraqi currency with a new currency. This was a massive undertaking that involved printing and transporting to Iraq and then distributing within Iraq 2,200 tons of new currency and as we traded that currency against the old currency, recalling and destroying 13,000 tons of old currency. It was a massive undertaking directed by a very able retired uh, three-star general on my staff. It was incredible. He did it all in a country with no telephones, no banking system, no functioning banks, lousy roads, and a war. And it was done essentially without any problems. We also needed to get started helping the Iraqis start to address the broader macroeconomic policies. For example, I, I prepared a balanced budget for the first two years, for 2003 and 2004, which were the two years' budgets we were responsible for, to try to restore a sense of fiscal discipline. I created the first independent central bank in Iraq's history to begin to have a sense of monetary responsibility. We freed interest rates, which had been determined under Saddam by bureaucrats, and said from now on the price of money, like the price of other things, is going to be determined by the market. We licensed foreign banks. We revised the commercial and, and company laws. We updated their bankruptcy laws and patent and trademark laws. We even reopened the stock market. Now, the uh, results in the economic area have been quite spectacular really. Unemployment is now about half what it was at liberation. And by the way, since liberation there's been a 50 percent increase in women in the workforce. Inflation last year fell to 28 percent, which is admittedly still very high by our standards, but from 115 percent to 28 percent the direction is certainly right. Twelve times as many Iraqis today has telephones as before liberation, and 81 percent have better access to clean water than before liberation. So in many areas, uh, their life is better. Overall, the International Monetary Fund says that per capita income has doubled in the last two years in Iraq, and the IMF predicts the GDP will grow 17% this year. The first American investments, by the way, were announced about three weeks ago. Pepsi's going back in with a $100 million investment. Now let me conclude with a couple of comments about security and then take your questions. We knew from the very start that security would lie in the hands of the Iraqi people. It's their country. They should be prepared to defend themselves. They're facing two threats. One is from the Saddam loyalists who are at the heart of the Sunni-led insurgency. And they have a very simple vision for Iraq, which is to install, shoot their way to power and install a Saddam-like dictatorship. The second group are the Al-Qaeda terrorists. They are non-Iraqi coming from the various other Arab countries. And they also have a very simple uh, vision for Iraq, which is to install a Taliban-like Islamic fundamentalist regime in Iraq. Both of these groups share the view that democracy is bad for them because they can't get elected. So they're against democracy. 
And you may have seen in the press in the recent uh, weeks or, that there are signs of tensions between these groups. They're actually shooting each other out in the western uh, desert, Anbar province. I think we should all welcome this. <laughs> and I personally wish each of them much success. <laughs> now, we, set a, we started up the world's largest police training program uh, when I was there. And we also, as I mentioned, established a new army, a, uh, a National Guard. In my book, uh, I express a lot of concerns that I had when these programs were just kicking off in the fall of 2003. My concerns were that there was a tendency in our military to overestimate the capability of these forces, perhaps with an eye to saying that when the first big tr rotation of troops came, which was going to be in the spring of 2004 as the first uh, divisions that had come in had their year on the year on the ground and they would have to be replaced and I think there was a tendency by some in our military to overestimate the capability of the Iraqis to, to in effect replace American forces when that rotation came allowing us to draw our forces down as as it happened those Iraqi forces really collapsed when there was an uprising in April and May of 2004 and we had to substantially revamp the training and revise the training. They are now much better trained than they were a year and a half ago when I was there, and that is a very good, uh, a very good sign. Let me conclude with three uh, very brief points and then take your questions. First of all, uh, I'm optimistic about the future of Iraq. It's a rich country, and, and I don't just mean the, the natural resources. The people are dedicated, they're delighted to be liberated, and they want a peaceful, stable Iraq. The balance of power is with democracy in Iraq. And the Iraqis are optimistic about their future, which is a lot more important than whether I'm optimistic about it. The polls show over and over and over that the substantial, large majorities of the Iraqis are optimistic about the future. Secondly, Americans must be patient facing these difficult international uh, situations. I, I recognize that patience is not the most remarkable American characteristic. But I think it's important for us to remember that these kinds of transformations of these societies uh, take time, and we have to be patient. And finally, it's the benefits of stabilizing Iraq are very substantial because a democratic Iraq is the political co complement to a military strategy to defeat terrorists. Iraq is on the front line of this war on terrorism, and you need a military strategy, but you also need a political strategy, and democracy is that political strategy. As, and the terrorists understand this very well, by the way. Uh, bin Laden a year ago denounced the elections in Iraq as un-Islamic because they would put man and not God in charge of society. His deputy, an Egyptian doctor named al-Zawahiri, last summer condemned democracy, and I quote, as a new religion that must be destroyed by war. Democracy, a new religion. And Abu Musab Zarqawi, who's the head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, two years ago this month, in a letter that we intercepted to his followers, said, I can see democracy coming to Iraq. And then he said, and there's no place for us in a democratic Iraq. So the terrorists understand that democracy presents a strategic threat to them, a political and strategic threat. Tuesday night, the president said something that really relates to all of this in a State of the Union address. He said, the only way to defeat the terrorists is to defeat their dark vision of hatred and fear by offering the hopeful alternative of political freedom and peaceful change. Thank you. Now, Kim, what's, what's the plan? Um, it, it's an honor to get to talk to you. I mean, you essentially were the president of Iraq, and, and you rebuilt Iraq, in my view, faster than we were able to do it in Europe following World War II, and, and that's just amazing to me. The, the question that I have is, is the constant criticism of, of no weapons of mass destruction being found. There were 700,000 pounds of uranium. There were 
chemical-tipped rockets. I mean, none of that really made it out uh, in, in our mainstream media. And I was just wondering if you could comment on that to, to the extent that you're able. And thank you again. Thank you. The, the WMD uh, situation is still something of a mystery to me. It, analytically, there are three possibilities. Uh, possibility number one is that he had them and we didn't find them. It's not impossible. It's a uh, country the size of California. And you may remember at one point we found an entire Russian uh, MiG jet fighter buried in the sand out in the uh, western desert. You can put enough biological weapons in a footlocker to kill millions of people. So it's conceivable that we didn't find it. Uh, the second possibility, which has been talked about a fair amount in the last week or so, is that these weapons were smuggled out to uh, Syria. We saw some intelligence reports suggesting that there was some smuggling of this, these weapons to Syria. It's, it's at least plausible because we know Syria has given active support to the Ba'athist insurgency since then and has helped terrorists come up through Syria to, into Iraq. So it's, it's plausible. I have no way of knowing if it's true. Third possibility is the one that's sort of the accepted common wisdom, which is that he didn't have WMD. Now, the problem with that is, it's, and it's possible, uh, and it, 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 if, it, if it's the case, it certainly is a, a major intelligence failure because the intelligence community said he had them. But then you've got to remember that the intelligence services, not just of America, but of Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and Israel, also concluded that he had these weapons. And the French, Germans, and Russians were against the war, but their intelligence services also concluded he had them. So if there was a, uh, an intelligence failure, it's a lot bigger than just our our own uh, country. And I, I don't honestly know among these three options, I don't have a view as to what happened. What we do know is the last inspector there, a guy named Charlie Dulfer, in his report to Congress a year ago said that what he found was that Saddam had kept the programs, people, and equipment in place and had the intention as soon as sanctions were lifted to resume his programs. So that now you know everything I know about it. What is your opinion of the quality of media coverage, um, Western media coverage, of the activities in Iraq and the consequences thereof? Well, we had a lot of concerns, and I'll, I describe it in my book. Part of it, I think, I mean, our view was that we were only seeing the bad news, and I think it still is largely true. And part of that is a kind of understandable, because uh, bad news, you know, a bomb going off will get you on the front page of the newspaper, but if you're describing something good news, it tends to get buried. And we had a lot of um, discussions trying to get the press to focus more on the, on the good news, and there is a lot of good news. I mean, the economic situation that I just cited is very important. That's what really affects the people's lives there. That's why very high percentages of Iraqis say they're optimistic about the future, because, and it probably surprises Americans, because all we see is the bad news. But it's a free press, and they'll do what, it, what they do. We tried to get them to cover good news stories, but it wasn't easy. Please. Thanks for your time today. Um, in looking over the latter half of the 20th century, it appears to me that, that in Europe anyway, uh, a big part of our success was due to the, uh, to the Marshall Plan, in addition to our military victories. And in Asia, I, I think the program name was uh, Stratton Briggs. I could have that wrong. Does it make sense to uh, have a Marshall Plan style program for Iraq and under I realize it would be expensive and I realize that we don't have a lot of money as much as we did in, in those previous times but would it make sense to target Iraq for that type of reconstructive effort and if so do you think it would be successful well that's basically what we did you may remember I came I recommended to the president a, a major supplemental budget in, in in the fall of 2003 and Congress voted that budget it was 18.6 billion dollars so it was it was a fair piece of change. And it was directed, it wasn't modeled on the Marshall Plan, but the general conception was the same as the Marshall Plan, that, that we had a country there in Iraq that had been devastated economically, not by the war, different from, say, Germany or, or Europe, but by this misallocation of capital, pervasive corruption that had gone on for 45 years. It left Iraq with a terrible infrastructure, whether it was health care, schools, electric power, even the oil fields had been badly managed for decades. And I felt very strongly that we needed to do what we could to help them to help them grow because 
whatever you did on the political side, if you couldn't get the economy working, you, you know, these two things were obviously related. Now, as it happens, as the insurgents figured out what we were doing, they started targeting these reconstruction plans, and we wound up, as the papers have been reporting uh, in the last couple of days, having to shift a lot of the money for, away from electric power plants to security. Uh, and we had to spend a lot more on security. We had to build a much bigger army than I had initially budgeted for. The, the army that I had budgeted for was 40,000 men, three divisions. It's now about 107,000 men. So a lot of resources got shifted, but the idea of helping them rebuild was behind the supplemental budget that we uh, requested and which Congress voted for us. Well, it'll continue. Um, yeah, th I mean, our initial uh, project stack was about 5,000 projects, and we couldn't afford all 5,000. The 18.6 billion, we had to draw a line at 2,300 projects. Uh, and I don't know what the number now is, because obviously we had to drop several hundred of those because of the uh, security. But some of that, uh, some of those projects obviously have very long tails. They're going to take, it, it'll take a couple of more years for them to finish. Uh, if we continue to make progress against the insurgents, then that should help. I think it's the right approach, um, even though it has turned out to be a lot harder than we thought. Ultimately, how much do you think this is going to cost the United States, and any idea of how we're going to get this money back? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I, th I think the administration, I, I believe, just from what I've seen in the press, has said that they're not intending to seek more economic aid for Iraq in the next budget. So the total amount of... Um, economic assistance we've given is somewhere around 21 billion, 18.6, and there was another appropriation right after the war. Uh, and I know there were, I think, rather incautious remarks made by some people in the administration before the war that Iraq uh, would be able to re you know, pay for all this stuff and pay us back. Well, as it happens, uh, those assessments were based on an unrealistic assessment about the amount of oil Iraq could produce quickly. Uh, we found that the oil fields had been maintained very poorly, as everywhere else. And then the looting, which happened right after the war, the looters uh, uh, targeted the electronics and the mechanical uh, devices in the oil fields, stole them to sell them, seal them, smuggle them out of the country, whatever they did. So the problem of getting the oil revenues, which is the only, it's 98, 95% of the government revenues come from oil, they, that has been very significant. And I, I don't think there's a question, they're not going to pay us back. I think eventually, hopefully, there'll be a stable democracy and they'll be producing oil and, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be part of that mix. But I don't think there's going to be, they're not going to be paying us back. Thank you. There were uh, two things that you mentioned I'm interested in uh, that I hope you can provide some more statistics. Only two. Only two. Okay. I can go for three if you'd like, but there are no, two that okay. I'm interested in. you got a line in. behind you. <laughs> Stick right. with two. One was, uh, you said that the training of the Iraqi police and army was better now after yeah. the collapse in that April of whatever year that was. Could you quantify what that means? Sure. And the second thing is you said that Americans need to be patient. Yes. Can you quantify what that means? <laughs> Thanks. The, uh, I don't know if I can quantify the first. I can qualify it. Uh, what happened was we found when these security forces collapsed that the basic problem was a lack of good leadership among the NCOs and the officers. And what, the, uh, what our army then did was say, we're going to do more leadership, we're going to focus more on leadership, in particular by partnering, so that you put a couple of American officers in at the company level, sometimes even below the company level, to work side by side with Iraqi officers and NCOs to teach them leadership. And that's, that's the major change, really, in terms of uh, the quality. I don't, I can't quantify, I mean, I, I can just tell you the number. The number is 107,000 in the army. The second thing that the military did about the time I left was to say we ought to be able to discriminate between units, battalions, which are ready to fight, Iraqi battalions that are ready to fight, and those that still need help. So they, they developed a three-grade system, one, two, and three, for battalions and have now developed metrics to say this battalion is uh, level one, which means they're able to conduct attacks on their own. This one is number two. They can come alongside American. This is number three. They've got to be behind Americans. And so they've got metrics for each of those to put these uh, battalions in a, in a category, which is a much more 
refined way of looking at it than the way they were looking at it in 2003, which was just numbers. You know, okay, we got this many in the police force, that's great. Trouble was, those people, what was happening, and I say it in my book, is military commanders were going out on the street, sweeping up 18-year-old boys, saying, you want to be a cop? They'd say, great. They gave them three days training and hand them an AK-47. That's not a trained policeman. So then you get an aggregate number that says we have 50,000 Iraqi policemen. And I used to say to the guys in the Pentagon and, and brought it even to the president's attention, those are not trained policemen. So it's a much more refined way. On uh, patients, I, I don't know. I, I, think the, uh, I think we will uh, have troops on the ground there for a couple of years. And as the, as the situation on the ground gets better, and particularly as the Iraqis are able to take more of the responsibility themselves, we should be able to uh, begin to pull out our forces. But I think the President is right in this, that it should be done on the basis of the conditions on the ground, not on the basis of some artificial timetable. Saddam was obviously a monstrous leader and a threat to peace in the region. The world has other monstrous leaders and yeah. other threats to peace to the entire world. How bad do conditions need to get in those other countries before the United States is compelled to intervene the way it did in Iraq? Well, it's a good question. And I think my, my view on this is, having been involved in, in foreign policy for about 40 years, is there's no uh, cookie cutter. There's no template that says, you know, just because we did it in Iraq, we've got to do it in Sierra Leone. Uh, there has to be some, there is a general principle which is that our, as the President has stated, and I strongly agree, our interests are served by promoting democratic governments. But that doesn't mean we have to intervene all over the world all the time to promote democratic governments. A President has to make judgments. He made the judgment, in my view, a correct one in the case of Iraq. We may face a situation where we have to make similar judgments about Iran in the not too distant future. But I think, and there's a whole different set of problems with Korea. Each of these are different from the others in degree and in kind. And the president simply has to make judgments on each of them in their own way with a general strategic objective of trying to protect our security by promoting democracy. But I, I, I'd be very reluctant to say, you know, just because we did it in Iraq, we've got to do it that way ten other places. It would appear to me in order for this to succeed, um, the Constitution needs to be successful. And in order for that to happen, those three major religious parties need to learn how to share. What yep. do you think the chances are of that happening versus it collapsing in the Civil War? Uh, you're right. That is the key question right now. Uh, they need to put together a government of national unity, which means bringing in the Sunnis. And the conceptual problem that they all need to understand is that democracy is not majoritarianism. And this is a little hard for both the Shia and the Sunnis to understand. The Shia kind of like the idea, they're, they're certainly a majority, that democracy means the majority rules and sort of, you know, just keeps ruling. And that's also what worries the Sunnis. The Sunnis are 20% of the population, and they've got the same misconception that democracy is majoritarianism. The heart of democracy is the protection of minority rights. And I preached this at the Iraqis for 14 months. It isn't just a question of having elections, it's a question of protecting minority rights. And the Constitution has, in its second chapter, a, an extremely uh, robust, rich list of individual rights that are protected. And I, I'm not naive to think that just a piece of paper does that, but it is an indication that the Iraqis understand, in, in many ways, this point I'm making. Now, they have to now put together a government of national unity, and we designed the Constitution to make, that, make it very hard for any one party to actually rule alone. And we set up a series of hurdles in there which are now forcing compromise, which was our idea. Compromise is, is really at the heart of democratic government. And I believe they will come up with a government of national unity uh, that will bring the Sunnis in. And I think that that will begin to uh, bleed support away from the insurgency, the Sunni insurgency, as more and more Sunnis begin to realize that the best way forward for them is to work within the political system instead of trying to shoot their way there. So I'm, 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 I'm pretty optimistic about it. Okay. Well, of course. One of the basic freedoms uh, guaranteed by our Constitution is religious freedom. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, last September, I had an opportunity to meet a young woman who's uh, an Iraqi Catholic nun studying in the United States. And she described a situation where her family, also Christians, uh, had taken their children out of school because the schools were now forcing religious instruction, Islamic religious instruction on them, and that they were no longer safe uh, to attend school. Um, I've also read some things that the current constitution that has been approved does not guarantee those basic freedoms. Would you comment on that? Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, just on the second point, the constitution does guarantee, the, or, or, let's put it this way, guarantees the wrong word. The current constitution states an absolute commitment to religious freedom and freedom of religious practices, which was a point the Iraqi Christians made to me. They want to also be able to practice their religion. I think this, uh, uh, the, the situation for the Iraqi Christians is difficult now, and it's gotten worse in the last six months. Uh, I met with a group of Chaldean Christians in San Diego the day before yesterday, expressing their concerns, which I share. Uh, What's happening is, the, particularly in the South, the, is, the Islamic Shia parties are starting to put pressure on the Christians, telling the Christian women they have to be veiled, pressures in the classroom, some uh, looting or, or, or attacks on Christian stores uh, that are closing down. I don't think it has reached a crisis yet, but it is a serious concern. And I've encouraged the Chaldeans that I've met with, both in San Diego and Detroit last week, to mobilize themselves to start you know, talking about this with our government so that we can take whatever steps we can. The Christian community in Iraq is a great resource because they were always the best educated. They are very, very highly represented. There's only 3% of the population, but if you look at the lawyers, the doctors, the teachers, it's a much higher per percent. So the argument that I made to the Iraqis, the non-Christian Iraqis, was this is a valuable national resource. You don't want to lose it. And actually, most of them understand that. But there are some pressures in the South that are unsettling. Ah. Hi, thank you. Uh, everybody always assumes, and, and it makes some sense, that uh, having a democratic election is a good thing. In Palestine, they had a recent democratic election, which um, ended wasn't a up good thing. <laughs> with Hamas. Yeah. which, among other things, is a terrorist organization. Yeah. So I just wondered if you'd comment on that. Well, you know, uh, democratic elections don't always come out the way you want them to come out. Um, you'll have Howard Dean here in a couple of weeks. Ask him. <laughs> uh, Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor of Germany in 1933. Uh, in some ways, the Hamas election may actually have a silver lining, provided we do the right thing, because it puts the Palestinian people face to face with what they've done. My own view is that most of them did not vote because they agree with Hamas about destroying Israel. They voted because they felt that Arafat's system was so corrupt that they wanted to throw him out and get some other guys in. And if we can hold the line by not giving money to the, Pal to the Hamas government, it, it really begins to focus people's minds because they've got a billion dollar budget deficit. They're not going to be able to pick up the trash, they won't be able to run the schools, and then the Palestinian people are going to have to say, is this really what we wanted, or did we just want to get rid of the corrupt guys? And that then can put pressure on Hamas to modify its position, to drop its terrorism, to drop its view on, on Israel. Um, I guess my final point is, uh, would be to quote H.L. Mencken, uh, who said, democracy is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. <laughs> Thank you.